uh, now that it tells us that. I'm sure most of you are here tonight because you already know Meg or about her. Um, when Meg's photographic art has graced the walls of many a center for fine art photography around the country. And tonight, Meg's going to be discussing her series somewhere within and without. And I'm sure anything else you want to talk about. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Meg. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm, I decided I was going to um, give a little bit of uh, history in terms of some of the other projects I've done as well um just to, to sort of show you what a departure it is to kind of wind up doing the work that i'm doing now which is an ongoing series called somewhere within and without um but before we begin i just want to say thank you so much for having me this is such a pleasure and to see your space virtually and um to see all some friendly faces out there um thank you um for being here with me and sharing space tonight so i'll go ahead and share my screen, and then we'll get going. Okay. All right, so like I said, I'm gonna take you on a little tour of some of my um, previous projects and then wind up with Somewhere Within and Without, which is an ongoing series I've been working on since 2017. So before we begin, um, I would like to talk a little bit about a book that I absolutely loved. It's called um, Art and Fear, and it's by two gentlemen named David Bales and Ted Orland. And um, it was one of these sort of seminal works for me. Um, there are a number um, throughout my life, but this is one of my uh, sort of guiding inspirations from the beginning. Um, and in this book, I found a quote and it reads that the art that you can make is irrevocably bound to the times and places in your life, the very ground upon which you stand. And I want you to keep in mind sort of uh, three things about this, which are important that kind of resurface through all of the work and kind of keep me coming back to this book. Um, so this is meant quite literally uh, as in the physical ground upon which you are on. So geography in a sense of place that pertains to all the work you do. The moment of time you are existing in. So in, in that, like in the year. So for example, 2015 is obviously a very different year than 2020. I think we can all safely say that. Um, and then where you are in life, who you are in life while you are making, the things that you think um, that make up your identity, uh, age and gender and so socioeconomic status, origin story, birth order, all of these things, the roles that you play in your life or embody as artists. For me, it's artist and mother and friend, lover, colleague, um, and um, how all of these things sort of come to play in the work that you make. Okay, so if you are bound by time and geography, then how did you end up um, making work in Cuba? And so that's the first series I'll talk about today. Um, I published a book back in 2015 called Casa de Fruta y Pan, and um, it's really a testament to photography is how I wound up. My, my way there is through some photographs that my grandmother shared with me of her time living there with my grandfather. Um, this is a picture of them. That's Chuck and Barbie. Um, in 1946, this was pre-embargo. She was age 19, um, was from Philadelphia, uh, and, you know, found herself in Cuba. And, you know, after that, found herself in a, a number of other places um, following her husband and his career in the Navy. Um, but she told me about stories and food and experiences she had there, and it sort of planted a seed. Um, this, these are some other images of her. And, I think, you know, thinking about my grandmother, she was she was quite intrepid. Like I said, she was a, a you know, naval officer's wife. He was a cultural attache as well. And she followed him all over places um, like Guam and Panama and Hawaii and, you know, um, you know, found her way on ships that would head across to islands so that she could just go and um, visit them. And she was just incredibly intrepid and very brave and at the time, I was thinking about my point of connection to her, and I was 28 years old, and 
I had never been outside the U.S. before um, alone without the, you know, sort of sheltering chaperones of my parents. And um, so it got me thinking and I started doing some research. I thought, well, if I'm going to try and go to Cuba, I need to know more. And I came across this woman named Amelia Weinreb. She's a cultural anthropologist and she wrote this book called Cuba in the Shadow of Change. And um, in this book, I found a quote called the, that says that the real Cuba, Cubans tell you, happens behind closed doors inside ordinary people's homes in their living rooms and kitchens. To gain any real sense of perspective, one must go as anywhere, but particularly in Cuba, into private space. So it was really important to me to make work inside people's homes and to have a little understanding how that fluidly transitioned um, is I was already making work prior to this with my multiple generations of women in my family inside their domestic spaces, living rooms, bedrooms, and making photographs of that and, and making comparisons. And so it seemed quite natural for me actually to go into Cuban space in a way inside people's um, domestic spaces to make photographs. So I wrote the US Treasury um, to try and get a, um, a license to go to travel there and they denied me and I decided I was going to go anyway. And so in 2011, I went um, with about 200 rolls of film in my backpack. Um, I got held up at customs for a while because they thought I was trying to sell that film in Cuba. Um, but I, I went and um, I, I traveled all over. Um, you know, from Camagüey to Havana to small places like Vinales, um and small beach towns like Sancti uh, Spiritus and um, made photographs in, in people's spaces. And um, this project sort of continued over the course of three years as I traveled back three different times and documenting and collaborating with families in their spaces. These homes were open to um, tourists and they're called Casa Particular, which literally means private house. So after the collapse of the communist bloc in 1989, many families and doctors, lawyers, dentists, you name it, engineers, um, had to make the decision um, to open their doors to their homes or at least one room at a time in order to make a second means of income because their you know, uh, income was state regulated. And, so they did this in order to make more money to supplement that. And um, these images that I'll show you are uh, represent sort of a modest cross, cross section of the homes that I stayed in. And they attend to a way of life that was previously private and then really became public by opening it and making it accessible to tourists. Um, but it also kind of marks this transition I think that was happening at the time when I started going in 2011 and my last time there was in 2014 and um, you know that you know Castro's rule over Cuba was waning and sort of this outdated political model that all Cubans had sort of been living under which was communism. Um, so my work draws upon cultural anthropology and sociology and literature those are my undergraduate degrees um, to examine how racial, political, and economic histories shape and transform these communities. But more importantly, how these homes function as sites of negotiation between private enterprise and economic imperatives of a communist state. So given my background in the social sciences, um, I'm attracted to the way that people immerse themselves in various subcultures um, to seek um, you know, greater understanding about connections between people and differences, obviously, but participating um, in observing customs and rituals and daily activities. And by way of understanding history, politics, and economics, as well as other social, social phenomena which affect communities over time. So, I, however, I make a distinction between myself and a traditional eth ethnographic um, you know, researcher um, for oftentimes they go into places and they don't make their identity known. They try to say, for instance, um, you know, if they were trained to study a subculture of waitressing, they would go in and pretend they were getting a job and then they would work there for a period of time and they would observe everybody from the point of an insider um, and not necessarily like divulging their identity. And, um, you know, for me, obviously, as a student American, I was a graduate student when I started this project and it was important for me to be as transparent and open as possible 
um, in, you know, mainly because I was making these pictures and wanted to make pictures in collaboration. And so to have that kind of trust and access um, was important to me. So in this kind of interaction um, through interpersonal experience, there's both a subjective and objective, a fascinating dialect between participant and observer, which I think is kind of something a, a bit of an arc that goes throughout all of my work, including the project I'm doing now. Um, and also between insider and outsider that constitutes critical engagement with other societies and hopefully reshapes our perception of communities as a whole and through through this how we can relate to one another so instead of using a pen um, like most ethnographers um, i use my camera and film and i'll say i uh, also kept a daily journal to make sure that i stayed as true to my experience from my perspective as possible um, but the work that i made in collaboration with these families is an alchemy of my academic background, as well as my personal feelings for family in the private, even sacred spaces that we call home. So the images reflect a sense of transition and transference from familial experience to those that take place while living with these families. So an image like American Thanksgiving, um, for instance, depicts a tradition not celebrated in Cuba. Um, it was important for me to do something for the family that I had come to know and love. That was one of the, the families I stayed with the longest while I was in Cuba, and I returned pretty much every year and stayed with them multiple times. And the first time I went, I was away from my family. It was the first Thanksgiving I, I had ever been away, and I really wanted to um, do something for them. So I asked if I could make them a Thanksgiving dinner, not really understanding at the time either that, you know, Thanksgiving is a very problematic history in itself, but um, it was an, it, a really interesting experience and a kind of collusion between like American Cuban culture, which is, you know, obviously a very much a part of our history between the two countries. So it's also, you know, again, my way of showing gratitude and thanks for um, taking me in and, um, you know, showing me around and collaborating with me, of course. So I'm also interested in the intersection where private meets public in um, these images when you're looking at them sort of objectively um, through the, the medium that I've chosen. So the lives of the Casa owners are on public display and they're open their homes to tourists. So they're paying to be there. And inevitably this forces a sense of formality um, and how they keep their homes, how they interact with people, what they do or don't do in public, you know, space, even though this is their private space. It also requires, you know, a certain kind of professionalization and expectation of the space itself. So through things such as increasingly higher demand for amenities, as one of the Casa owners, Isabel, had told me upon returning multiple times of how the amenities were having to get like higher and higher and higher. People were expecting more and more and more, um, much like they would in maybe the United States with Airbnbs. So it does not just pertain to the home itself, though, this kind of private public kind of intersection, but how the families comport themselves. Um, simultaneously, they are also functioning spaces where they live their lives and go about their daily routines, just like the rest of us. Um, but in a sense, they're both insider and outsider too, mirroring the com complex position of the documentary eye. So the act of making a photograph is both private, personal, and a, I think a very subjective experience. Um, the act of choosing to focus on certain areas of a home, a shared meal, or a person you are connected to makes it so. It will also say, um, I'll also say that photographing someone or something also um, forces a kind of formality and creates a platform for observation and study and most definitely conversation afterwards when you've shared the image with someone else. So I believe that photography in summation about this series, um, the act of observing, making, and sharing of an image has the capacity to reflect and create connection between people and the self. And it shifts the way in which we perceive places and people who are in relation to one another's similarities um, and differences abound and where we see our points of intersection. Um, so I will move on to the next project, which is Honey Milk. Um, so uh, after making work in Cuba, I you know, was working um, as an adjunct in, at uh, USC in Columbia, South Carolina, 
and um, I attended this uh, this festival um, in Pike County, Georgia called Slow Exposures, which I'm sure many of you know about. And um, going back a couple of years, they finally ended up opening this residency and it was the first one they opened and they had a call for entry and I applied and I knew that I wanted to make work there. I was so excited because I had been there a few times and was incredibly inspired by just the landscape and also all the people I had met thus far. Um, and I decided I wanted to make work about women in maybe not so much their domestic space, but about their environment and um, and about their experience of raising children in the South. Um, and so my proposal was to make work, make some books. Um, and uh, I ended up getting that residency, which was really exciting. Um, and of course, I thought, well, you know, I, I need to read up and figure out like what exactly I'm going to do and how I'm going to approach this and um, who I'm going to work with. And so I um, ended up, you know, leading up to this particular year in 2015, which they coined uh, the year of race relations at the time Atlantic Monthly did. There were a number of things that happened in 2012, 2013, Trayvon Martin started the Black Lives Matter movement, um, Michael Brown, Eric Gardner, Freddie Gray. It was also that year in 2015, that was the 150th anniversary of the Civil War's end. So it was a pretty prominent year and all of this was leading up to me making work in the South. And I wanted to work um, with women of color in the community about raising children and being raised in this environment um, specifically. And so it was also that year I ended up reading this book by a gentleman named ta Coates, um, who won the MacArthur Fellow that year for his writing on race relations in 2015. And um, it was a really profound book for me because um, really a, a, a sort of a, like a love story or a love book to his son, Samori, who is pictured here. And um, it's a personal narrative um, and it talks about the legacy of slavery, the Civil War, his experience at Howard University, um, but, you know, it's all sort of woven into this book, which is kind of telling him what to expect and sort of his maturation of being, uh, you know, raising a, uh, a son who is of color and um, what that might be like for him and what his experience was like. Um, so that book, again, really changed my worldview because I was pregnant with my son. Oliver. And um, so I knew that I, I wanted to sort of make work about childcare um, as, as much as I could. And so I also, during that time period, um, well, in that book, I came across, the, across this quote, which said, um, an America that looks away is ignoring not just the sins of the past, but the sins of the present and the certain sins of the future. So I really didn't want to be that person, especially knowing that I would be raising another human. Um, and so, um, you know, I always start, if I don't know something, then I try and work my way into a kind of knowing. And, um, and that often works hand in hand with reading and researching, but also um, in working with people. So at the time I was also reading about feminist standpoint theory. And um, so this theory to sort of boil it down has a lot to do with our perspective and how we experience the world. Um, so from unique standpoints of marginalized communities from perspectives, which I would hold. Um, it's also about societal knowledge and being located geographically and societally um, and in you know societal location. So it, it turn, in turn, knowledge becomes distinctly unique and subjective, and it varies depending on social conditions under which this knowledge was produced. So in taking this into account, I obviously can't speak from a perspective I don't have or even a standpoint I don't have. So in order to make work, I needed to really lean upon um, literature, theory, um, and scholarship of women generated by women of color like Kimberly Crenshaw and Patricia Hill Collins and um, you know, Sandra Harding, and in doing this research, if, if it was my desire to make work with women in the community, it would also have to be in collaboration and, and, and as much as I can from their perspective. So, so in the process of speaking with various women um, in the community about these topics, we also touched upon experiences around migration and displacement, um, how that transition affects um, perspective of, say, for instance, being both insider and outsider, which was this young woman's experience, Mahalat, 
Um, she's actually Ethiopian and she was um, adopted by missionaries and she landed herself in, um, you know, Zebulon and um, you know, she just had a very interesting sort of perspective of what it was like being raised in this small rural town in Georgia um, and being a person of color. And um, we talked about a number of things, including strangely like quantum physics, which is interesting because I do a lot of reading about that now, but, um, you know, an education, the educational system um and you know just like what it meant to be black in america and how that really was very different for her because she identified as being ethiopian not black um like that means one thing is what she once told me um so through conversation and storytelling on the part of women i worked with um images are created and constructed together so um which in turn helps generate more conversation so i did end up bringing some of these images maybe not all of them, but some of them back to women. And then I would continue to have conversations about the actual photographs um, to unpack, you know, uh, larger ideas about systematic racism um, and the legacy of inequality. Um, so much of that has to do with access to knowledge and systems that prohibit that access, but also for furthermore, just access to experience in general, like a common everyday experience and joy. And so on the left, um, you have um a what was a segregated school um and it was converted into a storage place i think in the 1970s and then um on the right you have um a spring that was shut down by the lions club after or rather than integrating it which is really interesting and it's it's a it's a it, there's a mile marker to to show that that is a place that people should visit because it was a space that um, you know, was a really thriving pool at one time. And it's just interesting that it's sort of also like a, a mark for uh, segregation and racism and the lack of integration. So I think a lot about um, how the effects of those remnants um, in your space or reminder always of these systems in place um, and how this would affect women and young girls growing up here in this small rural region of Georgia and looking at how those systems were built and how they function and how they impact our communities and our children. Um, and so for me, when I started this project, I don't, wouldn't say I knew very much. And um, even in the some times of you know, learning more, I won't say that I landed in, in a space of, oh, I've got it and I understand everything, um, but uh, you know, I had a lot more questions that I ended up asking myself at the end of the project is like, you know, how do you take all of this in and internalize it, you know, the information and these stories that you're hearing, what do you do with that, um, you know, especially in terms of this work and, um, you know, is, is, is this project, you know, capable of doing what I had set out to do, which was um, sort of have this um, kind of experience and understanding and share that experience with people. So I don't, I don't know at the end of the day, but you know, it's it's a good place to start from, and um, you know, I do I do really cherish those relationships that I um, that I generated in that time. So I'll move on to another a project a collaboration um, in, in a different way um, with uh, an, a fellow artist. Uh, his name is Elliot Dudick, and we created a, a book, generated a book from that series, and. Um, it was a uh, sort of a making work across the expanse of Nevada on this highway called the Loneliest Road in America, um, Highway 50, which has been traveled, um, you know, and uh, traveled quite a bit by a number of people. And um, it's in the state of Nevada, if I didn't already say that. And it's really just sort of this physical exploration in the landscape um, delving into some history of that you know, road in particular. Um, which was coined by Life Magazine as the loneliest road in America, which we found very interesting from a psychological point of view. Um, and we thought, well, we should go and make work here and try and see like what that meant to us in those particular periods of time in our life, um, what that meant um, to travel along that road together, um, making work with our cameras um, from our own perspectives. Um, so established along the Pony Express in 1919, 
and coined by Life Magazine as the loneliest road in America, Highway 50 is known for traversing a desolate and sparsely populated stretch of seemingly barren country. This project was really born out of a curiosity. So what does the loneliest road in America look like? Um, but what does it also mean to each of us? And how might we both make work traveling across this road, approaching this idea separately through our own lenses, but together, and then presenting those sort of side by side, not delineating whose image was whose um, in, in the, the book itself. So the series of images builds upon the multi-layered ground that is Nevada's harsh but rich environment, history and culture, a history which witnesses the absenting and repopulating of culture from the native tribes of the Washoe, which inhabited Nevada for millennia, to the immigration of French, Portuguese, and Chinese with the introduction of the railway system and the mining of copper, silver, and gold. It also references Nevada's economic fluctuation over time. So from the boom of the great silver strikes in the 1800s, mid 1800s, um, to the big bust like 2008 economic crisis, which you know was really hit many places pretty, pretty bad. So the work speaks to the idealization of the road, the American idea of freedom, to the long-standing photographic tradition of traveling west, manifest, you know, manifest destiny, really, on um, the sort of the history of that even along this road. Um, and all of the images were made um, using analog, again, film, four by five cameras, as well as eight by 10 cameras. Again, to reference the history of photography, um, and the insatiable human desire for exploration and also documentation of sort of these pristine places that had been untouched. So it is along this road um, that we chose to explore love and loss and longing and wanderlust, um, to dive into those spaces we inhabit where things are often unclear. Our hope and goal was for the book to feel like an experience um, for the viewer. Um, who is sitting with that, you know, uh, art object. Um, the book was constructed to sort of reflect, reflect that. Um, so again, you, you open the book and you kind of travel along as if you have been invited to go on this road trip with us and you experience the photographs through your own lens. And at the end, there is um, um, two pieces of what we call poetic prose. It's neither prose nor poetry, but it's poetic prose, I suppose. And um, from our unique perspectives, reflecting upon that time period, it wasn't written at that moment in time we were traveling, but it was written in reflection. And so you get to read those and then um, those two perspectives of that we were having in reflection, and then you get to go back to the beginning and hopefully kind of look through the images again to try and um, sort of see the coloring based on that um, perspective. And I'll just show you some of these last images. And then here's this gorgeous picture of Zane of my own baby. Um, and his name's Oliver. He was born in 2016 and it was really one of the most singular experiences for me. And um, I was also seven months pregnant traveling across, you know, Nevada making that work. And so, you know, a couple of the projects I made in this um, series had, had a lot to do with my experience of being a mother and, um, and how that sort of changed the way in which I work um, because of that kind of like sort of visceral experience of caring another child. Um, but I've come to know that all the projects that I make really are a reflection of where I am in my life, both physically um, as well as, um, you know, psychologically, internally, externally, if you will. And, and all things, I usually start from a place of unknowing, and then I move towards the greater understanding. And um, somewhere within and without is a visual inquiry into the process of my unfolding and my becoming. Um, it's an ongoing series that has been my preoccupation for the last four years of my life, really the longest project I've worked on ever. Um, it began in 2017 on a small farm in Texas when I traveled from Lexington, where I was living at the time, um, to a farm and I found myself kind of um, homeless and <laughs> didn't have a house and didn't have a job. And, um, and it, so it was the summer I came back home, though, I had been away for about seven years and I was a new mother. I, I was up until that point, the breadwinner. I was definitely without a job and, and facing a very uncertain future and also didn't have the means or capacity to really travel around anymore and make work, um, which I kind of knew was coming. 
um, as, as I had in the past. Um, and so it was my great fortune that I was able to make some work in the studio in, in Brenham, which, um, and the reason I was able to do that was as I was commissioned to make some work for this um, theater in, um, called the Unity Theater in Brenham, Texas. And um, our family friends had allowed me to stay in their, their house so that I could make some work. And so there was this potting studio. I just like sort of extracted all the potting things and <laughs> planted myself in there to make work um, for this theater. And then I ended up starting this project, which I've been working on for the last four years. So, but again, it's a, a, a really uh, amazing space for me. And um, I will say that it was during that time because I couldn't really travel as much that you know reading for me became like my travel companion I it, because I couldn't physically go places I would travel through books and really travel through experiences um and so I was reading a lot and um and in and you know any anything from like poetry to fiction essays you know personal experiences a lot of Joan Didion um and then I started reading um uh, you know, a lot about physics and um, whatnot. But anyway, I came across this guy and he's a 17th century Dutch philosopher and he's one, he's one of the early um, thinkers of the enlightenment. And, you know, he said in one of these readings that an individual is a process and it got me to thinking. Um, so a process, you know, is the passage from one interaction to another where we are as humans, a constant change or in constant change and flux and transition. We're really sort of a vibration, if you will, just bouncing around from one thing to the next. And our brains have like a hundred billion gazillion neurons in them. And as many as there are stars in the galaxy with an even higher, more astronomical number of links and potential combinations through which they interact. And so we are like memory and reaction, we're anticipation. And so I'm thinking about all of these things um, and we undergo this continual transformation and we're also very impermanent. And so all of this stuff is really where the heart of this project lies. It's like about my own personal lived experience, but also this sense of, and of course this happens after the birth of my child, but you know, this sense of the internal external and this sort of objective perspective of like the meaning of existence, but also like my own very subjective, subjective experience in life. Um, so that's where this, this work lies really. So these images are an attempt to deconstruct the ways in which we engage with time, reality, perception, memory, and the ephemeral. Um, so each image uses light and matter um, to process personal lived experience and to make sense of the world around me. And I construct these quiet still lives that attempt to direct the gaze from this external space inward. Um, so the image, so this particular image for me is really a metaphor for the enormity of processing the larger questions in life and how we really are just sort of the sieve. Um, I use everyday household objects to construct these images as a means to mark poignant transitions, experiences, and moments. Um, so, you know, when you kind of feel like you're, you know, moving through this threshold, if you will, and it's very visceral, and you notice that there's this huge change in sort of who you are, this is your process, you're changing. Um, it's, you feel as if it's something that you could sort of walk through. And it's not perceptible to the eye, but it, it feels so real. It feels as though you could touch it. And, um, you know, so a lot of these images are about trying to sort of make a mark of, uh, you know, those kinds of very uh, sort of um, seminal life moments, if you will, that you have. Um, so say for instance, recognizing that there has been a dis disassociation or a disconnection to the self, um, which definitely happens after, you know, um, you pass through a threshold or you have, you know, go through a rite of passage, like say for instance, the loss or separation from someone or the birth of a child, and you recognize that you are this essential self but you're disconnected from that. And it, you're very aware that, you know, you can't really go back to that person that you really were before. So it's kind of this like loss. Um, sometimes images come about in the series uh, and they're just as much a performance um, and a remnant of a performance um, as they are, you know, constructed based on memory or an experience. So 
Um, this is sort of an interesting photograph and it's really multi-layered. Um, won't be able to get into all of it today with you, but uh, the story is fascinating to me. I was, I was staying at this farm in Brenham and making work there and I had found on the side of the road, really weird thing to find is like an entire um, refrigerator <laughs> in the middle of nowhere, Texas. And I decided to pull out a shelf of that refrigerator because it had some glass. And then I just thought oh, I, I could do something. Of course, you know, like all photographers are, you know, I think Sig Harvey said all photographers are borderline hoarders <laughs> picking up things off the side of the road. But anyway, so I um, pulled it back to the studio and my mother was there helping take care of my son and I had invited her while he was napping to come and, um, you know, do something with this piece of glass and it, my vision was to just put a crack in it like, you know, put a crack in the glass ceiling that's kind of like what I was thinking and then so we found this rock and started hurling this rock at this piece of glass tempered glass and um, we kept hurling it and hurling it and it never broke and finally she hurled it so hard that it ended up shattering into sort of a million pieces and I thought well that wasn't exactly the intention but it felt you know it was interesting because we didn't really we didn't laugh and we didn't have a conversation about it it was just it, it's really hard to describe it's just something that we did together and I knew and I felt like it was really profound and it had this like larger larger sort of metaphor for our relationship but also just domesticity and womanhood in general and so um, I decided to make a picture of the tempered pieces and then so I found some parchment paper in the kitchen and I laid it out outside on the gravel and cement actually and um and then you know very you know delicately she and I like placed all these pieces of tempered glass onto this parchment paper which you know has all these sort of like quadrants and stuff to sort of like excavate and um you know so it's just a it's a really interesting image because it's it's really much more about like that experience and a remnant of that experience but it has much larger sort of implications and metaphors so this image um, is about access and connection to memory. Um, so, you know, I think about how, you know, there's various events or things that happen in your life and they really do um, sort of change you. And, um, and so I also think about memory and how we access those various events that we've had. And, you know, for a long time, people thought that memory was like this filing cabinet that you would pull out and you'd open this file of a memory and you would, you would look at it and you would, you know, remember this memory exactly how it was. And then you put that file away and next time you open it back up and it's the same as it is. But we actually know now that memory doesn't work like that at all. And um, actually, every time you remember something, you actually degrade the memory itself. And, and you can you can recognize this when you have like multiple people in a family get together and they're trying to remember something the same way. And that's obviously perception, you know, based on particular individual lens. But um, then later on, that person's memory will also change. This is why humans are not very good eyewitnesses. Um, you know, in things in terms of the law, um, because our memory is so fallible. And so I was thinking about that and, and the, how memory is like sort of in a way, remember remembering these poignant moments in your life are actually in some ways inaccessible to you. And, um, but furthermore, it's also about the content in the image, which is um, a bunch of these waterfalls, which really waterfalls are just sort of an aberration of a flow in life, right? They are like a disturbance into that. And they're also, they're incredibly emotionally powerful. And so each of these sort of waterfalls is meant to sort of be um, experience in life. So these images also attempt to combine in one space many disparate events um, to put them on display and examine them from a more objective point of view from the outside instead of from the inside. And this image is also meant to allude to the event that is a life. Um, and I, you know, thinking about how I am an event on this planet and you're an event on this planet and um, events by nature have limited duration. And so this work is dealing with real events or happenings in my life, but also um, in a large way engaging with larger questions about the meaning of existence and my own mortality and you know, these kinds of ruminations didn't really begin before the birth, birth of my son, which is just so interesting. Um, so this image really is, it's, it's simultaneously about a number of things, but it's about birth and growth and 
obviously, you know, the metaphysical, um, but it is also about like the big bounce and sort of where all of it began. Um, it also references the unfolding of the self and um, sort of like pulling back layers to get to the pith of who you are. So it's like you're pulling it back and pulling it back um, to get to like your essential, your essential being, whatever you were when you were born before all of these things sort of happened upon you. Um, this photograph um, is me trying to put into an image what happens to an experience or an interaction um, when it's reduced to, when it's compressed, like a memory. Um, so as Joan Didion states, um, in theory, these moments or these mementos that we have left over from experiences serve to bring back the moment. But in fact, they serve only to make clear how inadequately the moment was appreciated when it was here. So this photograph is simultaneously about a memory of my mother um, and what I believe I will always have and remain in my mind. Um, and this sort of like how it's been distilled into this like one thing that I poignantly remember about it. Um, but it is also a kind of reminder, a future reminder really of how to be more um, fully present in those experiences that I wish to, you know, sort of take in more fully. This image called a soft and conscious morning is a reflection upon loss. Um, so loss of love, uh, loss of time, loss of value, loss of memory, loss of connection, um, but it's a kind of grieving that's really soft and it's small and it's quiet and it just sort of is like this malaise and it happens and it even kind of goes unnoticed to the self and um, you know most definitely to others, but it's, it's a sort of a conversation about that kind of like soft mourning of, of yourself. Um, again, all these images draw upon personal historical experience in this way the images are very much like my own personal code. I am definitely sharing some of that code with you tonight, and, you know, with these photographs, um, sort of like taking a poem that is a portion of my life and distilling it. And the images, this distillation is like the abstracted sort of crystalline form of, of, you know, much larger experiences or moments in my life. And it's sort of elegantly fixed into a photograph. Um, so the simple quotidian things found in each image are meant to ground us in the domestic. Um, it's very purposeful. As you can see here, milkware plate, marshmallows, thumbtacks, white snakeskin, a jelly donut strewn across a table, you know, reminiscent of, you know, Dutch vanitas and um, various still lives throughout history. But, um, you know, and they're all common objects, right? That they're very recognizable. You can maybe find them in your house. Maybe not the jelly donut um, <laughs> if you're a health freak, but um, but not quite when you know they're recognizable, but not quite when they're placed um, in relation to one another. And there's a kind of creation of new meaning and um, discomfort, really, um, that is intentional in the arrangement of how they're placed and what they are in relation to one another. So I believe it to be true that in order to learn something, it is necessary to have the courage to accept that what we think we know, including our most rooted convictions, may be wrong or at least naive. When I conceived of this photograph, um, I was thinking about a very, uh, yeah, a horrific experience in my life and how this event changed my perspective and my worldview. And after that experience, I had a conversation with my mother and she lamented with me, you know, sitting on a, I think it was my dorm room floor and that she said I could no longer look at the world through rose colored glasses. And, um, you know, in the before the rose colored world, there is a sense of security, like a blanket wrapped around you or a child that trusts inherently. And that is until there is some event that happens to you. And then there is a shift in how the world is perceived from that moment on. And I, you know, I was, how I felt was I was literally, quite literally extracted from the world that I thought I knew and the safe place that I was sort of existing in, which, you know, I recognize now in retrospect was also very privileged because I don't know that all children, are, you know, wait until they go to college to, you know, feel safe from, you know, in terms of experience in life, but um, it, it, how that particular experience really marked a transition for me into adulthood and to, in a way I didn't know is kind of like losing your baby teeth and getting your new adult teeth. And 
Um, so this image for me was all about coming to terms with how that sort of fund fundamentally changed who I was and how I didn't really have that experience until looking back upon that many, many, many years later. Um, so it's kind of like reading in reverse. Multiplicity is my attempt at trying to understand reality. Um, so that cosmic game of mirrors and web of interactions, kind of network of emotions. Um, and I'm still coming to terms with what this image means to me. Some of these images are quite literally like, I took them last month. And so <laughs> there might be like two people on the planet besides you all that have ever seen these. Um, although I think I did post this one on Instagram. so. I take that back for this particular one, but um, you know, you know, it's a, it's one of those things where sometimes things are so new you don't necessarily know how to articulate what your intuition has done or your subconscious has done in terms of the work that you've made. Um, but for now, it's about my matrilineal line for sure. This is a picture of my mother when she was going to an eighth grade dance, um, and it's also, a, you know, a very poignantly talking about, at least for me, what is coming up is about dualities in my own life. So my mother used to say that it takes the mind a while to catch up, um, and she'll still say this, um, to intuition and also to the subconscious and to what the body as a receptor absorbs. And if we are the process, like Spinoza says, if each individual on this planet is an event, this turbulent, vibrant, happening on this planet in a sea of other happenings, um, coming to terms with the abrupt confrontation that at any moment we could melt away is really quite profound. Um, so I feel this was something that I felt a lot during the pandemic and the sort of vastness, right? Um, but also this sense of impermanence. And I, I really do also feel that our sense of like, you know, everybody's reality was very different. Um, and everybody's sense of time changed quite a bit. But um, yeah, there's just a lot of ephemeral coming up. So Aristotle said that the place of a thing is what surrounds that thing. So I believe he was speaking about a precise definition of space or place when talking about where something is in relation to other things. However, when I read this, all I could think of was the metaphor inherent within it. So where you are at in life has so much to do with all that which surrounds you. So you can only be really where you are, um, but everything is um, sort of like contextually driven um, in terms of, of who you are. And um, this has so much to do still with the sort of lockdown and the pandemic for me. So it, it was during that time we kept doing a lot of reading, <laughs> um, it, you know, and this last year and one of the books, the many books that I read was Mary Oliver's Devotions. I'm sure many of you have, have partaken of her luscious, luscious um, poetry. Um, but in it, there's a line in one of the poems and it says, and it's the last line, what is it that we plan to do with the one wild and precious life? And the thing I kept coming back to was begin again and begin again and begin again. And it's like starting over every day. Um, you know, a fresh or a new. And this image to me is really much about time. It's kind of a, you know, a reference to that poem and that not that saying for me, but also really about the fleeting nature of time and how we live our life by it and how yet there is just absolutely so little of it. Um, so as far as I know, uh, or at least as, as far as the knowing that I'm landing in right now, my ground, if you will, um, right now is that the future is truly very unpredictable and that we must have more compassion and empathy for the self and this time we are given and that there's no change in the past and we have little control over the future so that we must be curious and dive into the process wherever we're at in that moment and because the world that we have been given is the world seen from within and not from without. So that is where I will end my presentation and say thank you so much um, for staying with me and listening to this and um, letting me share some of this, some of which is very, very, very fresh, brand new work with you. It's actually exciting to do that and be in a, in a space of vulnerability. So I appreciate you and um, I'm totally open to questions if anybody would like to ask some. Hello. 
hot slime. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Meg. It was gorgeous. Thank you. Feel free okay. to put them in the chat as well um, if you want to put a question in the chat. Yeah. Linda, you it all. Just, uh... <laughs> all right, go ahead, am I? Okay. So my question is, do you use mostly natural light or uh, I think uh, many of images look like it, but then even in some indoor images, that's why it seemed, is that a preference? Yes, it is. It is a preference. I, um, you know, I, I consider light like a collaborator, really. I often will go into spaces and search for the light first, and then I will bring my little trove of objects into that space and make a photograph based on the light. So it's like the light shows up for me. We meet each other. We have like a small conversation. I maybe take some pictures with my cell phone and, you know, sort of track how it will behave. And, um, and then, you know, I'll come back and try and, you know, recreate in, in the space and later it's, you know, and, and, Beyond that, I would say that, you know, a lot of these photographs, they seem like maybe they could take a very long time, but um, they're very, they're very quick, sort of, they're not quick images in terms of content, but they're quick in terms of the fact that the light, you know, is only going to last like that for a period of time. So they're quite ephemeral, but yeah, the, the natural light is a, is a conscious choice. I've, I've often sort of kicked myself that I can't, <laughs> that I could maybe create light and then have more options. Um, but uh, I love the sort of like serendipity of how light shows up in a space. I just think it's really just quite magical. That's a good question. Thank you. Thank you. And just by the way, your description is like poetry. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Wow. Thanks so much. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, we have questions in the chat. So when you went to Cuba, did you travel on your own or with a guide or a group from the US or did you know of people on the island? So when I went to Cuba, I did go alone. Um, I did definitely meet up with other people other times that I went there um, and uh, traveled around periods of time by myself and then with others. But no, I, I consciously made the decision not to go with a group. Um, because I didn't want to have, a, and I, I forgive me if anybody's been to Cuba in a group, because I don't want to say anything that would, might sound not right to you, but I didn't want it to feel prescribed, and I wanted to have my own experience, and a lot of those groups are like cultural tours or religious tours, and I did research those, and there are workshops that go, but you kind of have to stay together, and you have times and places you have to be somewhere, and you drive in a bus and then you get off and you photograph and then you get back on and, and they take you to the to the woman with the cigar and, and the cars, you know, and the, the certain new classic buildings. And I really wanted to be inside spaces and have my own experiences with people. And I knew that I couldn't do that if I was with others. And um, I knew that I couldn't do that if I was staying at a hotel, which is sometimes the case with those tours. So um but, and, and did I know people? No, I didn't know a soul when I got there. I, I had, I'd found a casa online before I went and chatted with her through the internet. There was no deposit made because they didn't do that then. I don't know if they do that now, but uh, so I didn't even know really if it was a scam or if I showed up and I might not have a place to stay. Um, but I just, I showed up with my 200 rolls of film and kind of just made my way across the island. <laughs> um, but, you know, really, there's a, there's a lovely connection of CASA owners. They know people, and so they put you in touch with somebody. But thank you so much, Elizabeth. That's a great question. So Yvette, oh my gosh, Yvette, so nice to see you. Um, can you say more about how you conceive of your collections? Do they come to you in dreams or in meditation? Hmm. Okay. Well, the, you know, all of the work that I have um, done sort of out in the world, um, that is all just like response, right? It's just reaction, response, and obviously whatever's going on inside me in order to make those images. But with the newer work, um, it's, it's part 
you know, obviously, like I said before, collaboration with light. So it changes as, you know, as light sort of starts to track, then you move things and things become kind of like this quick kind of collaboration. Um, but some of them are um, conceived beforehand through sketches. Like I'll just have like a vision of something or I'm very influenced by whatever I'm reading at the time. So like right now it's a lot of like physics and quantum physics. <laughs> I'm so crazy. I took one physics class in high school, so I don't know how I ended up here, but um, it, it makes sense, you know, at a certain age, you're just very curious about, you know, these questions, these larger questions in life. I don't think you're so curious about that in your twenties. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, some of them are very, very constructed and made from sketches, and then others are are just very um, intuition based and reactions to environment and light and oh when that color doesn't look right of a sheet so let's take that out and put this in so um but yeah thank you for that um okay swan um thank you for sharing your beautiful work thank you for being here might you share more about the role of bookmaking plays in your practice so um it's so interesting I have always known every time I make work, I always know that I want it to be a book beforehand, um, even sometimes before I make any images. And, you know, and I think that's because these are all, for, at least for me, and I'm, you know, and I'm sure other people would agree, it's such a different experience having a work be in a book versus in a virtual space or in a gallery or at different sizes in, you know, physical space and um, are on a website. And um, I don't know, like I grew up around books. My mom's a writer. My brother's an English professor <laughs> and I'm obsessed with books. Um, but yeah, that sort of like intimate experience of a book and how that changes your experience of the work um, and how you can really touch somebody on that very personal, intimate level through a book. Not saying that that can happen for them in some other kind of iteration in a gallery. They go to the museum and then they feel like they've been touched. But it, it I, th I feel like it happens in a very, um, it, it literally feels like I'm, I'm reaching out and or I'm sitting next to them, you know, in, in through this book, through this vehicle, which is a book. And um, and also just the very, the, the million different ways that you can, the iterations that, that a project could take just based on material and um, sequence and the additional essays or writing that kind of give it context. And I'm it just, yeah, there's just something about the book for me that just really is like the end of y'all. It's like, if I could only ever like do books, I'd be okay with that, you know, if it never went into a space, I, I would honestly think I would be okay with that because it feels so personal to me. Um, thank you for that question. Any other questions? Oh my gosh. Well, this is just more of a comment. I thought your phrase personal code really um, uh, addressed almost all the images you made throughout. Um, and it, it is very personal. When, when I look at your images, um, I think they invite individual exploration, but they really are all about you, you know? And it's interesting because you, any, you're putting together the collection of objects. Other people might put together another collection of objects that would, and come to a similar conclusion. But it, mm. so I thought that was very interesting. Um, the other thing is the last dozen or so images um, all had, I don't know if they all did, many of them had like a soft cloth or drape that was part of the foundation for the image. And it kind of, to me, implied a soft landing mm. as, as though you're an optimist, as though things will work out. Um, uh, that there's a bed to sleep on mm. and and uh, so really those are more observations than anything oh lovely observations oh <laughs> my goodness yeah you sound like a poet too a soft landing wow yeah 
I would agree. I would agree with that. I think you know because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of content that's behind the images that is hard content, um, and it's and you know purposely not trying to hit somebody over the head with that. Um, but I do think also I'm I am an optimistic person, so I love your reading of my work. Thank you. It was a wonderful critique. <laughs> This is why we all show up, you know, I love it. Oh my gosh. Oh, Meg, if I could just kind of step right on top of Linda's, uh, her observations, I wanted to comment a little more on that is, you know, as I look at your work, I've always just so drawn to your compositions. And to me, there's this strong sense of calm yet turbulence and balanced and not and it's almost like there's always something on the edge, some little twist or turn that's about to fall or it just fell. Um, and there's that sense of turbulence and balance, and yet it's out of balance. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the process, the intuitive process of being in that studio and arranging those objects. If they, there's something that's always crooked, like you're, there's not a parallel horizon line. I'm just obsessed with you know, things being parallel. And I, I love the way it, that little bit of crookedness sets us gives us a sense of tension but yet there's also a curiosity that just draws you in to examine every one of those little objects and kind of imagine how it fell there or why it was placed there i was wondering if you could talk about the symbolism of how physically you create that space like do you move things around a million times and then shoot or like what's your process yeah i mean i think oh, gosh it, it makes me think of that Twyla Tharp book that you shared with me and because she's a choreographer and and this, um, you know, obvi obviously like following your intuition, but it really is like a dance when you get in the studio, I think when you are working in a studio. And if you see like images of like Barbara Caston in the studio, like it's totally like a dance for her too. It, you, you move around a lot. It's actually very physical work you know like you're getting up on top of things and getting lower and you're always changing your perspective and you know what's interesting is I started using my cell phone as a new way of snapping notes and so I'm like oh I didn't look at that perspective and so I might change it and I never used the cell phone in that way before which has been a, a fun addition to to my process but yeah I think and then the, on top of that, the light is just constantly moving. So like you're shooting for a while and then the light's tracking and the light's tracking, then you got to move everything again. So sometimes it, it ends up being that where you thought you were going to start is not at all where you ended. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I, you know, sometimes you'll put like I'm sometimes I say like I put everything in the kitchen sink in the photograph and then I start plucking it out you know like <laughs> too much too much and then it's like too little and then you put something back in and um but yeah it's like it's just a total total dance of like knowing that you know you have to have certain objects in the image but then there's other things that are there for like a delicacy or an imbalance or uh, you know color or um, a sharpness, like, you know, going back to like history and the photography, like punctum, it's like kind of hits you there that you, you need that extra thing. It's like a, that one extra thing so that the photograph doesn't fall flat, um, for that emotional aspect that you want to try and get across. And, um, so yeah, it's, but it's a total, it's a total dance. I often find myself quite sweaty. <laughs> day it's like an aerobic workout um but yeah that's such a good question but to speak about gravity though because you know things are on the edge or you don't know where the wall is or that's all so purposeful um because I think um again going back to like art and fear and that line it is about like your groundedness and you know at least in this sort of last series or this series that I've been continuing to make it really is a sense of your the process of a human life is the fact of being both grounded and not grounded all the time and interweaving this it's it's literally that all the time and so you know if I'm making work kind of about my process that has to be a part of it too this lack of centeredness or lack of gravity 
that life is not symmetrical. Our faces aren't symmetrical. You know, it's like, you know, there's that imperfect or imbalanced thing is so important, you know, the imperfection. So thank you, Susan, for that. <laughs> so delightful. Wow. This has been the best. Okay. Well, thank you, Meg. It's been a great evening. Thank everybody else for showing up tonight. It may have been a small group, but it's a very insightful group. I'll say uh, so. Oh my gosh. Wow. I'm going to have to go write in my journal for a while. <laughs> <laughs> thank you everyone for showing up. I, I so appreciate you. I hope you have a good evening and thank you, Michael, again, for having me here. I'm, I'm so grateful. Meg. Um, before you get away, next month, August 19th, we have Doug Dubois for the Artist Talk. And since Dale is here tonight, we'll give her a plug for Book Talk this Saturday. We have Dale talking about her newest um, adventure, What Lies Within. And Bill Gentile will be talking about Wait For Me, True Stories of War, Love, Rock and Roll. Mm -hmm. So thank you all and have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. Thank you, Meg. Thank you.